Well hey there idiots, welcome back to Observe. Today's video is going to be centered around one of the most requested analyses on the channel, and it's that of the late Jean Benet's older brother, Burke Ramsey. Now, I have already done a video on John and Patsy Ramsey, who are Jean Benet's parents, so I highly suggest you go and check that one out first, as I am going to be utilizing a lot of the information that I learned there during this read as well. So if you would like a backstory and some of the details, head over to that video. The link is in the description below. But before we dive in, let's talk for a second about today's sponsor, which is Exter Wallets. Now, Exter Wallets has been a longtime supporter of Observe, and I continue to promote their products, and there's good reason for that. Not only are they one of the largest manufacturers of smart everyday items with a specific focus on wallets, but they also have a few other items as well, including key trackers, laptop sleeves, and phone cases. But let's talk for a second about their wallets. While I use the space grade aluminum card holder for my day-to-day -day carry, it includes all of my cards, ID, and a GPS tracking card so I can find my wallet whenever, wherever, I have also used and greatly appreciate a few of the other lines in their assembly, not the least of which is the Senate and the Parliament. Now the Parliament has a little flappy flap that you can open, and the Senate is a little bit more condensed down. It's also a card holder, and all three are excellent options, and they're all designed to not only be smart, trackable, but also to keep your information safe. So if you would like to be able to capitalize right now, they are having a Valentine's Day sale where you can get up to 20% off of any single item on their website. Go ahead and follow the link in the description below. The sale ends on February 14th, but that's enough being said. Let's go ahead and dive into the actual video. Now, for those of you who are looking for a full backstory on the Jean Benet case, please refer to my earlier video. Today's video is going to be centered specifically around her older brother, who was nine years old at the time of the incident, but he came onto the Dr. Phil show in order to have this breaking interview, and a lot of people were very, very put off by his nonverbal communication. They found it to be very odd, and understandably so. So today, I'm going to be analyzing that interview, talking about the nonverbal communication of it, where there are misconceptions, where people may be getting stuff right, and where there may be some secrets that we didn't know about before. As I continue to talk through the case, I will reveal more about my character sketch of Burke Ramsey himself. Now, I went through the entire long interview and took out certain points that I felt were important enough to be able to talk about on the channel here, and the ones that I felt really revealed the most to us as the viewer. So this isn't the full interview, this is my hand-selected portions of the interview. You are welcome to go and watch the full interview yourself if you would like. I have also linked that video in the description below, but for now, let's start the analysis. When you look back, was Christmas like a really big deal at your house? Yeah. Decorations in the yard. I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for right now. This is a generic question. There's not a lot of weight behind it. So I am using this portion of the interview to establish what little baseline, nonverbal baseline, I can of Burke. And for those of you who are watching and are new to nonverbal communication, if you don't establish a baseline, the read itself will become far less accurate as you're starting to rely on generalities rather than specific nonverbal patterns. So I am looking for an established baseline for Burke during this, but it is still very, very limited because there's very little footage of Burke interacting on a day-to-day -day basis that would allow me to have an established and reliable baseline. But this entire portion is going to be talking about his baseline, seeing how he acts on average questions so that we can compare it to how he acts on more intense or pointed questions. On the inside, my parents would throw a party every year. Hello, I'm Hatsu Ramsey. Daddy's not here, but this is Jean Benet. She's four, Burke is seven. And we'd like to welcome you to our home and wish you a very Merry Christmas. Now, two days before Jean Benet was murdered, that was when the party was at your house, right? Yeah. 
And you had people tour the house? I think there was like a like a Boulder home tour thing. Like we weren't the only people that did it. Right, they went house. I'm gonna talk about something that I see that pops up in Burke's nonverbal communication the entire time. And when he is recollecting, when he's recollecting a genuine event, an actual memory, he consistently looks off to the side in this general area. That is his area of recollection. And he also has a slight squint to his eyes, which means that it is genuine recollection. That's important to note because if that pops up any other time, then we know he's genuinely recollecting. Whereas if there's a variance to that, that could be a sign of a fabricated memory, aka a possible lie. But that note, that pattern that we have made here is important to keep track of throughout the rest of the video. Also, a certain dynamic that I want to point out here that just starts to leak into my field of view, so to speak, is back here when Patsy is introducing Burke and Jean Benet, you can see the favoritism that already shows up in her body language as she pays more attention to Jean Benet and Burke is a side thought. That dynamic is really important, and I'll get to that later on. The house yeah. looks at all the decorations. So when do you guys open gifts? That Christmas Eve or Christmas morning? Christmas morning. Do you remember what you did that morning? I remember peeking down, and I remember seeing like an electric train and a bike, and I was super excited. Was John Bonet with you? I'm going to talk about something that everybody has noticed, and it's one of the reasons that this specific interview has been so highly requested for me to view, and that's this smile that Burke has on his face. This smile stays consistent throughout the entirety of the video, except for maybe a few instances. But this consistent smile, this expression, remains on his face throughout the entirety of the video. And many people find that extremely unsettling, especially when it gets to more of the gruesome aspects of the case and the questions therein. He maintains this smile. I'll talk about why that smile is there in a little bit. For now, let's keep establishing this baseline. Yeah. Did she peek too? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. Did you get what you had asked for that year? Nintendo 64. And what did John Bonet get? I think she got a big dollhouse. Something that I want to point out about Burke's tone is that when he's recollecting and unsure about something, his tone increases in both fragility and also pitch. So that is an indicator of a lack of confidence. So when he is not certain about something, those two tells are going to be prevalent in those instances. So if we see that specific tonal pattern pop up later on in an area where he's trying to sound very, very authoritative or confident in what he's saying, then we can understand that he is not actually feeling that confident. And that's the little blip that we had to work with. After this, the interview really started hitting hard with heavier questions. And so our baseline that we have for Burke, the very, very small one that we can have, is one, the smile is always there. It always seems to be there, but it's forced. That's important to know, and I'll talk about, like I said, a little bit later. And then also, when he's recollecting, he looks off to the side in the same way every single time. So if we see a variant from that, it's a red flag. Along with that, his uncertainty tells are an increased pitch level and fragility in tone. These are all things that we can keep track of as we continue on in the read because they can be more or less open doors for us to understand what Burke's mental processing is throughout the entirety of this video. You're nine years old and your mother comes in the room in seemingly the middle of the night because it's dark and says, where's my baby, where's my baby? And then runs out of the room and you just lay there as yeah. opposed to getting up and going out and saying, what's going on? And then a police officer comes in your room, which I yeah. assume is the first time in your entire life that a police officer is coming well, in your room with a flashlight looking around and you still just stay in bed. To be fair, I didn't know it was a police officer. It's just kind of... But somebody comes in your room with a flashlight and you never get up and say, what is going on here? I guess I kind of like to avoid conflict or I'm... I don't know, I guess I just felt safer there. Were you curious? Okay, so right off the bat, let's talk about a few things that are popping up. First, Burke has some extraneous fidgeting, common in nerves, 
not going to be really focusing on those. So the finger fidgeting and some of the hand fidgeting that you'll see, there's also times where he shifts his position. These are all tales of nerves and would be expected in just about any nationally televised interview. No big deal. The things that are really interesting to me is that one, he still keeps that grin, that smile across his entire face pretty consistently. Earlier on, there's not as much. And then as his nervousness ramps up, as the pressure ramps up, so does this expression, this expression of perhaps joy. It's not, it's not joy. I will let you know that it's not joy, but this expression pops up more and more frequently. And while he's recalling, he still has the tonal tells that indicate that he's not completely confident in the words he's saying. Now, is that because it's 20 years ago and he's remembering a very long time ago? Or is it because the events that he's recollecting are not genuinely the events that happened? I promise I am going to get to that smirk, that smile and the reason for it, but it is going to be later on in the video because I feel like it's more important to cover it later than early, early on. I'm not the worry type. I'm not the, I guess part of me doesn't want to know what's going on. <laughs> Critics would say you weren't curious because you already knew. He didn't have to get up and go check because he knew exactly what had happened. I was scared, I think. I mean, I didn't know if there's some bad guy downstairs that my dad was chasing off with a gun or, you know, I had no idea. So. Again, that tonal variance comes in, I had no idea. And people are suspect of Burke's actions. And to be very, very valid, Burke's actions in this situation are strange. And I do believe that there's a specific reason for why that is. Let's keep watching throughout this so we can see and continue fleshing out this nonverbal character sketch as to who Burke Ramsey is and whether or not he's guilty. Were you scared for John Bidet yet? I think I was trying to be positive. So this one was just a little blip because Dr. Phil asks an important question. Were you scared for John Bidet? And he says, I think I was trying to be positive, which in essence is answering the question, no, I was not scared for John Bidet. I wasn't. I was trying to be positive. I think I was trying to be positive. There's not any verbal confidence in that, so I have no confidence in that. What I am getting and what I am confident in is that he was not scared for John Bonet, and there's a reason for that. The next thing I remember is going to another one of our friends' houses. Everyone was really sad over there, and my dad came and told me, John Bonet is in heaven now, and then he started crying. And then I started crying. A few things that I want to point out non-verbally is, once again, this intensified grin, smile, expression of joy on his face throughout the entirety of this more or less tragic recollection. People are wondering, why is this so disconnected? And, and I'll go ahead and talk about that right now because it shows up throughout the entirety of this interview and I might as well get this out of the way right away. This smile is not duping delight. It's not joy and it's not happiness. It's forced. It's a forced expression. If you look, his smile stays the same. His expression stays the same, except for he's talking and moving around, but the expression itself stays the same. Now, emotions do not last that long. Emotions last a very short amount of time, and his expression is staying consistent. And what this means to me is that this is not an expression of joy, happiness, or duping delight because all of those would be a much shorter expression. This is a defense mechanism that Burke has. His nervousness is pushing him to force this odd smiling expression throughout the entirety of this interview. So when you see this smile, I know it feels off. It feels wrong to you. You feel like he should be frowning or crying or showing distress on his face, but instead he's grinning like he's talking about some really cool hobby of his that he really enjoys, where in realistic terms, he's talking about the death of his sister. So you feel like that's wrong. And I understand but non-verbally speaking and psychologically speaking, that specific display, that display of a grin, especially in times of morbid circumstances, is neither unheard of nor is it uncommon. People will often laugh in times of 
pain and suffering, and likewise, they will smile in times of nervousness. So this is Burke's display of intense nerves. All the way throughout this interview, he is extremely nervous. So when you see it throughout the rest of this interview, it's more or less having to be disregarded. Now keep in mind that there can be variances from it. There can be nonverbal spikes from that specific little concept, that baseline tell of nerves that we've established. It can vary. And during those moments, it's important to note it. But for the rest of it, even when you really feel like, ah, oh, he should be sad looking right now, you can't because his nerves are overriding his other emotions right now. And it's showing via a smile. So I'm very sorry if you saw this and you saw him smile and you were like, mm, he's guilty. That's not enough right now. It's simply not enough. How did you feel seeing her? A lot of sadness. I don't think I really fully grasped. Like after this, I won't see her again. I don't believe that he felt that at all. He said a lot of sadness and he avoids eye contact. There's nervous fidgeting off to the side, which is still part of his pattern of nerves just due to the interview. But long story short, I simply don't buy it right now. And there's not enough solid evidence for me to say for sure that he wasn't sad, but he doesn't display any nonverbal affirmative actions for that. So I'm making a note of that and I'll keep track of it. And if there's anything that goes against that later on, then I'll have to change this. I just have to, because that's how scientific method works. You discover new data and you change what you have to fit the new data. So let's keep watching. Are you aware of these different theories that are out there? Theories that you killed your sister theories that your mother killed John Bonet, and theories that an intruder killed John Bonet. Those seem to be a little bit of frustration that's showing that he's heard these theories and he's frustrated by them. He's also looking down, more or less averting his eyes from Dr. Phil, and this can also be seen as an expression of shame. So the chances are he's both heard them, he's frustrated by them, and he's ashamed of those theories as well, that's what his body language is telling me, and that's likely how his train of thought is flowing from what I see non-verbally. Be the three camps that people talk about. Yeah, I mean, if, I know that we were suspects. I, I didn't know they were camps, I guess. He has his continual smile. It's still there, it's still prevalent, but he showed no other non-verbal misalignment. And that means that he's telling the truth more or less in this part. He has been aware of the theories and he didn't know that there were camps or whatever. This is just showing that we have a decent idea as to the authenticity tells of Burke at this point, but we'd still need to gather more data for this. Does that look like her handwriting? <laughs> Honestly, looking at that, she would always bug me about having good handwriting and she would like, <laughs> make me rewrite stuff to try to get me to have good handwriting and I think it's too sloppy. <laughs> so during this portion, this is about the ransom note. The ransom note that was left in the Ramsey household in regards to Jean Benet was three page, two and a half pages, but three pages long, a very long ransom note. I went and I did a lot of research to see what, what was the average length of a ransom note? Just more or less, what's the average length? Now, obviously there's no template, but from what I found on the average of them, they're most of the time very short, under a page, under a page. So to have a three page ransom note, that was odd. You can go and watch my other video to see what I think around that, but I just find it odd that if there were an intruder, they took the time to find the pen and paper in the middle of the night after doing this terrible crime to write out a very long and personally detailed ransom note that's three pages long in the middle of an adrenaline rush after doing an intense crime. It just does not make sense. It's usually pretty straightforward. We have dot, we want dot. That's usually how it goes. But with this one, there's so much extra detail that doesn't need to be there. There's so many red herrings, odd word choices, and the handwriting is undeniably similar to Patsy's handwriting. I said before, I don't believe it was actually Patsy's handwriting, but it's undeniably similar to it. So with both John and Burke denying the similarities between that, that's suspicious to me because you and I can see clearly that there are similarities. Also, during this time, Dr. Phil asks a specific question, does this look like your mother's handwriting? And Burke starts to have some positive spikes 
in his nonverbal communication in the form of nervous laughter consistently throughout his answer. He doesn't have this nervous laughter often and it shows up in a large pile here. Along with that, he doesn't directly answer the question. And these sorts of tells push me to believe that he knows it looks similar, but he knows that he should not say that it does. So he tries to circumvent the question. He has nervous laughter, which is a spike in his nonverbal communication. And all of it lends me to believe that he knows it looks similar, but he won't say that it does. You cannot recall a time in, in your life that you ever saw your mother fly into a rage. No. Did you ever see her throw anything? No. Did you ever see her break anything in a fit of anger, smash anything down? No. Dishes, lamps, no. throw anything at your father? No. All right, so during this time, Burke's being genuine. His body language is synchronized. There's nothing that's sticking out to me as a possible red flag. Even the lip compression at the end is easily related to the negativity of the questioning itself but his head shakes are all synchronized. He doesn't break eye contact in his way that he does when it's more suspicious. And he has none of the tonal variances that show his lack of confidence. During this time, Burke seems to be, non-verbally speaking, being genuine. I don't think Patsy was a violent person. I just don't believe she was. And Burke's non-verbal communication goes to show that further. Did you feel left out of that, or was that okay with you? No, it was totally fine. I mean, I spent a lot of time with my mom, too. <laughs> Don't buy that part. And this is where I'm going to talk about that dynamic that I saw earlier. And then at the end of this, I'll talk about how it all plays in together. Dr. Phil asks Burke, were you jealous of the attention that John Binet got? And Burke answers in something that sounds not only hollow, but also the verbiage of it itself really indicates the true emotion of it. So Dr. Phil says, are you jealous, more or less? And Burke shakes his head and says, it's totally fine. I got to spend time with mom too, you know. He has his nervous laugh in there. And that indicates to me that he wasn't totally fine with it. He just wasn't. And very rarely are kids totally fine with one child getting more attention and more preferable treatment than themselves. It's very rare. So when Burke is saying, no, it was totally fine, I don't buy that. His body language doesn't lend me to buy that either. My theory, from what I can see so far, is that Burke did not like John Bonet's specific amount of attention that she got. He also didn't like John Bonet herself very much. There are many instances of Burke's lashing out at Jean Benet, going so far as to even hit her in the face with a golf club out of anger. He often smeared feces in Jean Benet's bed, and there is this history of hostility between Burke and Jean Benet, and I, I feel that this is entirely the fault of John and Patsy Ramsey for showing clear and evident favoritism between the two, and I will tell you why that's important later on. Both say there was a voice at the end of the 911 call, and that your voice was heard saying, What did you find? Did you speak those words? No. Were you there when that call was made? No. So you were not there and you did not speak those words? That's correct. That part I don't believe as much, and it's largely to do with his eye contact. Now, I need to make something super clear to you. The eye contact thing with lying is not a universal thing. If somebody's maintaining eye contact, if somebody's looking all over the room, that's not a universal thing. It's not like, oh, if they're looking everywhere but your eyes, they're lying, or if they're only looking in your eyes, they're lying. It's specific from person to person. From what I'm seeing with Burke, he maintains eye contact during points of authenticity. That is his tell, his specific nonverbal tell. But when he has instances like these where he's asked very pointed questions and his authentic tell is to maintain eye contact, my question is why is he looking all over the room, looking down, looking away, and not looking at Dr. Phil during this moment? If he's being honest and he has shown that he has the proclivity and the potential to maintain eye contact during stressful and intense questioning, why is it now that he's not? And 
chances are is that he's not telling the truth here. Now, this isn't enough to say that he's not telling the truth. I'm not actually sure if he was there or on that recording, but I am pushed towards him being there and on that recording, just based off of his nonverbal communication. But we'll talk a little bit more a little bit later. So you can say with absolute certainty that is not your voice on that 911 tape. Absolutely not. Still not making eye contact and absolutely not is another one of those verbal patternings like the, oh, it's totally fine. It's over the top. It's not needed, but it's still implemented in there because Burke feels that he has to convince Dr. Phil of this, which can be said for his innocence. If he was innocent and he wasn't there, then he needs to convince Dr. Phil because he indeed was innocent. But if he's lying, he still has that need to convince Dr. Phil because he wants the lie to be bought. And with his eyes being turned down the way they are, and we know more often than not, he will hold eye contact during authentic conversation and responses, then that lends me once again to believe that that might not have been true. Is it enough evidence? By all means, no. But that is the direction that I'm being pushed. You went to see a, a child psychologist. Do you recall that? Yeah. Ooh, that's an important thing just to know in Burke's character. So Dr. Phil says you went and saw a child psychologist, correct? And Burke flashes a very telling expression of contempt. Now, contempt shows up when a person is feeling like they are morally or intellectually superior to the concept, the discussion, or the person they're talking to, or about, so on and so forth. And Burke shows that in relation to the child psychologist, he feels intellectually or morally superior to that entire concept. The child psychologist themselves, maybe, the idea of going and seeing a child psychologist, he feels like he was above that. That usually is an indicator of the person having more information. When somebody flashes contempt, they have more information on it. So when Burke is flashing this contempt about the child psychologist, he knows something else that we don't know. That's what we can get from that. That's important, and I'll tell you why. And just, I, I swear, it's just a tiny minute. This, this little video clip is almost done. Did you hit your sister over the head with a baseball bat or a flashlight? Absolutely not. So during this part, very important question, right? He's asked if he more or less did the crime himself to John Bonet. And he shakes his head and says, absolutely not. Looks away. So we have some conflict here. On one hand, his body language is synchronized with the no and the no, the head shake and the no, but he also has his look away and the extra emphasis on the word absolutely. And those two have been shown to be signs of possible deceit in the past. Now, I don't believe that Burke did it. I'll tell you why in a second, but I do believe that there was hostility from Burke towards John Bonet, so he doesn't feel the remorse that we'd expect to see, and that could be lending towards this nonverbal misalignment that we're seeing. There's one last little blip here, and then we're gonna summarize. If someone in your house did, do you think you would have heard it? Probably, yeah. Nope, nope, that's the end. That's the important thing, and I believe that right there at the end, Burke lied. And the reason that I believe that is because, one, the question's pretty straightforward. If somebody did that in your house, would you have heard them? Now, I don't know if you've seen pictures of the Ramsey house, but it's not small. It's really not small. And we know that Burke and Jean Benet were upstairs because he recollected coming downstairs and looking downstairs to see the present. So he's upstairs. And Jean Benet's body was found in the basement, the very bottom of the house. Now, I don't know if you live in a multi-story house, but there's a fact about multi-story houses that really pushes credibility away from Burke in this instance. You can hear many, many things from the basement from the floors above because it's on the floors, but it's harder to hear stuff from the basement on the floors above. So the fact that Burke is not only on the first floor, but he's actually on the second floor of a large house, and it was known that Jean Benet was killed in the basement, there is no way that he could have heard that. There's just no way. Physically speaking, there's no way, unless there was maybe a scream or something along those lines, but as far as the actual impact itself, could not be heard. Along with that, Burke's body language during this point 
doesn't give us any reason to believe him. He says that he probably could hear it, and then afterwards, he does a very strong lip compression, which lip compressions can indicate a person who has said something that they know that they shouldn't. And in this case, it would be a lie, because Burke knows that he couldn't hear it, and his nonverbal communication really affirmed that. So Burke has the proclivity to lie in this. Now comes the part where we're gonna talk about my interpretation and my opinion of the case and the theory I have. My theory still stands that John did it. I still believe that John was the culprit. There's a few reasons and I'm going to talk a little bit about the family dynamic of the Ramses, specifically in relation to John Bonet and Burke and the parents. So, John Ramsey, the father, he came from a military family. In military families, discipline is very, very common. It's more common to see discipline in a military family than it is to not. Is that a hard cut rule? No. But it is a generality that has some evidence to back it up. So, if we take that information, knowing that John came from a military family, he appreciated discipline, likely. Also, he was the owner of a company, a CEO, and as we have seen in his video, emotionally distant. Even Patsy had enough issue with it that it became a conflict in their marriage that John was so emotionally distant. I feel like that was a theme. Not only was John a disciplinarian, but he was emotionally distant. So his relationship to his kids was not as strong. That left Patsy Ramsey. Now Patsy Ramsey was put in a tough position because she now really has the pressure of not playing favorites with her kids because John's out of the picture because he's a detached businessman. So Patsy Ramsey has to fill both shoes and she should have treated John Benet and Burke equally. We know that's not true. Not only is there the small little tiny take it with a grain of salt evidence that we saw at the beginning with the specific concentration on John Bonet that Patsy showed in the Christmas side and the off-putting side for Burke, but then Jean Bonet was involved in pageantry. So was Patsy. Patsy was always working with and traveling with and being involved with Jean Bonet. Where did that leave Burke? More or less, without attention from either parent, not from his distant father, and not from his mother who doted upon her daughter on Jean Benet. And when a child is secluded so intensely in their own family, hostility is not only common, but almost expected. And that showed up. We saw physical evidence. We know that Burke had hostility towards Jean Benet. Burke also had some aggression issues. He had some behavioral complications, and that was often directed at John Bonet. And my reasoning is, is that Burke had no interest in his sister. He was bitter towards her, and many of us could understand why. He was bitter of his younger sister, who got all of the attention from Patsy, which was all of the parental attention that there was to have because John was so detached. So Burke did not care what happened to John Bonet. So during these times where we're seeing this lack of empathy, this lack of care, it's not because Burke was a murderer. I still don't think he was. He doesn't fit the type. He could have, absolutely, he could have, and it could have been a cover-up from both the parents on Burke's behalf. It could be that. I don't believe it's so. I do believe that Burke did not care that Jean Bonnet was gone. He even showed later on in his psychological evaluation when he was a child that he had more or less put Jean Bonnet out of sight, out of mind, within two weeks of Jean Bonnet being announced dead. Two weeks. He did not care that Jean Bonnet was where she was. He did not care that she was dead. He did not like. Jean Benet. So when you're watching Burke and you see his smile and you see his detachment, if you understand the family dynamic behind that, the possibility of Burke being a neglected child in this family and having everything doted upon attention, time, effort, energy being doted upon Jean Benet, because Jean Benet is so close to Patsy Ramsey when she was a girl that obviously Patsy's going to dedicate more time to Jean Benet. If you look at it in that light, you soon see instead of a sick, twisted murderer of a person, you see a very wounded, 
neglected, and angry child. One who could not care less if his younger sister, who was the source of all of his jealousy and his anger, was gone. Now, there's so much evidence that's around this case. There's so many fine details. There's so many dynamics that I would be able to spend years on this case, and I still feel would not have a concrete beyond a shadow of a doubt conclusion. There's all of these possibilities, and to be fair, they have a lot of validity to them. I'm not going to deny that. There are other theories that have a lot of validity. But this is what I've seen non-verbally, and this makes the most sense to me in their behavioral patterns. But let me know what you think. Like I said, there's evidence for either direction on this, and I would love to be able to hear what you say. Let me know in the comments below. If you have another case that you would like me to look at, please let me know once again in the comments below. If there's any other cases you would like me to look at, I will take the most popular ones and run a poll, and whoever wins that poll, I'll do that one next. One more time, I wanted to go ahead and give a shout out to today's sponsor, which is Extra Wallets. Once again, if you're watching this and you want to get a pretty solid gift for a significant other or yourself, especially for Valentine's, head over using my link in the description below and you could possibly save 20% on any item over there. They are high quality. I absolutely love them. You feel so cool using the little card ejection button at the bottom. It's the best thing. I highly suggest you at least go and check it out. And if you buy something, it helps out the channel. So thank you. If you did like this video, hit the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell button as well, that allows you to watch it sooner. Like I said, if you have any other requests, let me know in the comments below. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys. Thank <laughs> you.